Okay. Shall we start? Perfect. Okay, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm Enrico Bertacchini from the Department of Economics and Statistics of the University of Torino. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, to chair this uh, final session of the Rethinking Culture and Creativity Workshop uh, uh, that has the title of uh, Unlocking Value from Digital Heritage Collections, International Perspectives. And uh, we have here together a very great lineup of, uh, of uh, speakers. Uh, Trice Navarrete, who is a cultural economist and digital heritage researcher from the Erasmus University Rotterdam, but also member of the board and chair of the ICAM International Committee for Documentation. We have uh, Mattia Sali, who is a PhD in economics uh, at the University of Neuchâtel, uh, but also research fellow at the World Intellectual Property Organization and uh, he has worked, previously worked as an economist for the Swiss Federal Institute of Intellectual Property. And uh, Professor Simon Tanner, from, uh, um, Professor of Digital Cultural Heritage, Head of Humanities, Faculty of Arts and Humanities of, uh, of uh, King's College London. And uh, uh, he has worked in uh, many different uh, fields about digital collections and uh, uh, also proposing uh, the balanced value impact model. The, uh, the session of uh, this afternoon uh, is uh, addressing uh, a topic that is in line with the workshop as we, uh, the workshop Rethinking Culture and Creativity is uh, dealing about how culture and creativity can be analyzed both from the digital transition and the sustainability transformation of our society. I will uh, just uh, briefly introduce uh, the uh, topic of today and then leaving uh, to the speakers uh, the uh, to the speakers the uh, just a moment can you see here okay yeah uh, so why we are talking about uh, this uh, topic about how to create how to generate value from digital heritage collection uh, this is a uh, uh, I mean, a quite established debate, but uh, so far in the last decades, there have been an enduring tension between uh, two divergent perspectives that somehow can be summarized, illustrated by these two paintings that you see there, that apparently are the same paintings. What is the difference here? Well, the paintings are two paintings from Claude Monet, La Cathedrale de Rouen, there are two paintings made in two different ages and two paintings uh, uh, that nowadays are owned by two different institutions. On the left-hand side, the Cathedral de Rouen is, the, is from the uh, Musée d'Orsay in France. On the contrary, on the right-hand side, you see uh, a similar uh, painting because it's uh, one year after uh, that is from the Paul Getty Museum. And these two paintings summarize the key difference in the two approaches, the two divergent perspectives that we have seen in access and reuse models of digital collection. Because the first one is, let's say, based on an exclusive proprietary control model where the images are controlled by the institution. Uh, and uh, well, for granting the access, uh, you need authorization, both for, especially for commercial reuses. The second one, instead, is open access and reuse, so a model that is quite free. So this is just to give you the uh, idea of the tension of the issue that we'll be discussing today. And uh, the questions that we will be trying to answer or to discuss, to address this afternoon are basically what are the costs and benefits of diverse policies, both for institutions and society as well, in uh, providing access and reuse of digital collections. Um, can institutions, cultural institutions like museums uh, adopt exclusive rights and licensing. It is uh, really financially, economically uh, viable. 
how adopting open access models impact society and cultural institutions. This is uh, some very uh, important issue. And uh, since we are not only seeing um, situation or a context where our institution that can decide how to manage their collections, also we would be interested, if it is possible, to understand whether national cultural policies can uh, somehow address this or favor or hinder these uh, uh, different perspectives. And finally, this debate, of course, about accessing digital collections is something that started many years ago when uh, basically the internet started and the first uh, opportunities for reusing images uh, were appreciated. But today we have uh, more and more technological advances and innovation like NFTs, virtual realities, application of artificial intelligence that possibly are changing the landscape of opportunities, but also of uh, constraints and threats for the reuse of images. So, uh, why these questions matter for Italy? Uh, we are here not discussing the Italian context, but more providing international perspectives that can inform uh, on the situation of the Italian context. Uh, here I'm trying to summarize in a very, very short uh, uh, description what is the situation, especially for museums, uh, uh, institutions. Uh, but Italy, as possibly uh, most of us know, has an extensive but extremely fragmented cultural heritage. We have, for example, in the museum context, more than 5,000 museums, archaeological areas, or monument institutions. And uh, we know this uh, situation as uh, most of the time hindered investments and the scalability of digitization initiatives. Uh, the governance model in Italy is primarily under public ownership, both at the state level but also local governments. More than 60% of heritage institutions are state-owned or belong to local authorities. And in particular, the current situation is uh, uh, that we have a legal framework that worked for many years so far, uh, which basically allow for non-commercial reuses of digital reproductions owned by uh, public cultural institutions, but at the moment uh, not for commercial reuses. So it's quite, uh, it's quite clear. What is the Basic, the, basically the situation, the outcome of this uh, current uh, context in Italy, that we have on one hand, very limited experiences with open access models. Very few institutions have fully applied open access models. But, and this is a, a very interesting point, uh, there are also no clear business strategies uh, for the commercialization of images. So the Italian context is somehow characterized. We are still in the middle. And for this reason, in international perspectives and inter discussion based on international experiences could be instructive also to understand the pros and cons of different approaches. Uh, why it matters in uh, this, uh, this uh, session that we have, uh, because uh, we think, at least I think, that uh, in Italy uh, this, uh, uh, this topic has not so far uh, been addressed uh, on an evidence-based, uh, with using an evidence-based approach. While in other countries, in other contexts, we have. Uh, just to mention three documents, three reports that uh, uh, can be mentioned. One uh, is uh, a very pioneering uh, study by uh, Simon Tanner here uh, that uh, was uh, studying the reproduction of charging models and rights policy for the digital images in American art museums, read in 2004, if I remember well. So he, we are here one of the pioneers of these approaches. But just to give you another idea, in UK, you see there is these, uh, uh, the second report that uh, it's called Striking a Balance, with a subtitle that possibly you don't see here. But uh, this report reflects on how to find a balance between public access and commercial reuses. So already providing evidence of experimentation of initiatives that are approaching in both ways, and try to understand in which context it is possible or not, uh, it is viable or not to adopt different models. And finally, France, that uh, uh, possibly is one of the uh, countries of the cases that uh, Italy, is, in terms of cultural policies, is closest as a model, uh, 
In 2019, for example, as released this report from the uh, national uh, courts uh, of uh, uh, national courts, uh, the court de compte, where they made an analysis uh, of uh, revenues, of costs uh, of the museum system, uh, both for the uh, internationalization and the uh, digitization. And for example, in the France model, uh, it's quite interesting because uh, they have uh, centralized somehow the control of uh, digital images for reuse, for commercial reuse with the uh, with the photographic agency uh, that manage the collections, uh, the images of the collections of uh, uh, the state-owned museums. And for example, from this uh, from this uh, report, uh, it comes clearly. Out out that uh, less than 1% of the revenues uh, are uh, uh, from the licensing of these images uh, uh, is part of the budget of the museum. So very few economic relevance. Just to give you a last detail before leaving the speakers to, to go ahead, uh, this uh, session uh, is uh, part of uh, a broader project in which uh, our university is uh, uh, involved and our department is involved as a scientific partner, but is uh, the project Empowering Italian Glamps that uh, uh, is uh, a project uh, promoted by Wikimedia Italia and uh, in collaboration with ICOM uh, Italia and Creative Commons Italia. And uh, this is uh, a project that is ongoing uh, in this uh, year. And uh, actually, we are trying to experiment with uh, allowing or trying to understand whether museums and GLAMs are interested uh, or what are their possibilities and opportunities to adopt uh, uh, models, open access models, or of some resources that they have, uh, not only images, but also any digital resources, including text, in order to understand whether these uh, uh, institutions are able. And the uh, results of this uh, project will come out in the next months. But this reflection that we are uh, putting forward today is also part of this uh, broader uh, initiative that uh, we are all collaborating to. So it is uh, my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Tanner that uh, will have the first uh, uh, speech and uh, then the other speakers will follow and then we will have also a question answer session afterwards. Thank you very much. It's going well. There we go. So, hi everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for the organisers for inviting me. I'm really pleased to, to be here and to talk to you about unlocking value from digital heritage collections. Um, what I'm going to... Oh, no, I need to actually click down here, don't I? Okay. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'm, uh, I'm basically your appetizer for the main meal, which is coming. Um, they've got data. They actually know what's happening now. I'm going to give you a little bit of a slightly historical context. But um, I wanted to, to, to very quickly at the beginning um, say, what do users want? What are the things that they're demanding from us uh, at the moment? Uh, how have some institutions changed to become more open? And, I want, and I'm going to focus there on uh, their decisions. What were the things that they had to decide internally that enabled them to break through some of the barriers that we all are, we all are aware of to be able to become uh, um, uh, open? Uh, and then to sort of reflect on what are the key values to unlock and the challenges in the changing landscape, the things that are changing, the things that are new, um, the things that are, if you like, eternal as well, those things which will always be with us. And I'm going to finish with a little, you know, just saying, I think that if you lean into your values, if you make decisions based on values, you're more likely to be able to reap the rewards and be able to find a way of linking your mission 
to other missions, whether that's of your, of your country, your government, uh, of your communities in ways that will be meaningful and rewarding. So very quickly, um, what do I think users want? Um, I think they want access. Uh, and you know, this used to be um, uh, all, all of the information everywhere, but I thought every, everything everywhere all at once. It's kind of where users are. They assume that things will be accessible digitally. They assume that they'll be able to have access to them. Um, this creates a lot of challenges because it now means that if something isn't online, it may as well be invisible in an attention economy. So it creates challenges for us, but this is an assumption that's there. Another assumption is that they, it will be sophisticated, that they will have sophisticated access, they will be able to do things with the materials, they'll be able to find them in sophisticated ways, and that um, uh, they'll have access to those materials, but at the same time, it will be easy to fly. So whilst the underlying data structures, the metadata, the underlying technologies, will all be sophisticated, the whole point of that sophistication is to make it easy for the user so that they can navigate through um, the resources as easily as possible. If they want to search your collection by colour, they can search it by colour. If they want to search it by an easy-to-use word um, like platypus, they don't have to know the Latin for that is monotreme. You know, they can find their way easily through your collection. So it's simple to fly, but that actually means sophistication beneath the, beneath the surface to enable that. And permanence. I'm speaking as an academic here. One of the most frustrating things is you cite a reference to a online resource and then the URL changes. Um, and I see someone going, yeah, I, see, I have the same problems. You know, so, so permanence means the resource is going to be there for a really long time. Um, and so if you're thinking about your museum collections, you're also thinking about your online collections in the same sort of time frames. How does that work? Permanence also means that if you reference something you make that reference easy for them to, to cite um, because academics don't cite unless they find it easy. And so that's also built on an assumption of the material being reusable. You know, we want to be in this cycle. This is a very strong commercial cycle for the country. It's a very strong creative cycle for your communities, for, uh, for academics and researchers, for schools and all different types of people in your community who want to be able to make um, and reuse and remake and recycle, and that to be a virtuous circle. And, um, and of course, we want to be able to create new knowledge. We want new knowledge creation for the record. And for a global audience, we want to be able to say, uh, these collections from your museum are important now, not just important reflecting on a period in the past, but they're actually currently useful, they're doing things, they're enabling new pers perspectives, new creations, new, new, res new making, and that's for a global audience. This is not necessarily, it can be for a local community, but it is also ex 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 sort of assuming that um, uh, in the same way that you want to attract tourists to your local town, um, you're attracting uh, global attention to your collections. So let me move on to some of the success stories um, that are out there um, and just to reflect that they weren't easy. And so one of the things that uh, was very kindly said at the beginning was um, I did some research uh, in, uh, which was published in 2004, uh, which was funded by the Andrew W. Mallon Foundation. And this was really to solve a problem that they had. That's why I was asked to do it. And so initially, I was asked to get engaged and, and look, at, look at European um, institutions. And that's available from, from uh, my uh, research website. Um, and then uh, from there, it was, it was can we engage with the, the charging models and policies for American art museums? Because that was seen as a, a particular area of, of difficulty. So if you look at it from the Mellon Foundation's perspective, their perspective was, we are giving literal millions of dollars to art museums or to collections um, for the purposes of digitizing and making available their uh, uh, digital images and content um, from their collections. We're also funding um, fellowships in, in art history and all sorts of different subjects um, of academics um, who are 
uh, working uh, in the field, and we want, they wanted to be encouraging to those things. And then, of course, what would happen is um, your um, art historian would go along to a Mellon-funded um, art gallery who digitized the collection and say, can I have access to that to, to use in my book, my publication? And the gallery would say, yes, here's a fee. At which point this person would say, oh, Mellon Foundation, can you pay this fee to the person who you've just given all the money to make this stuff available in the first place? And that was a bit of a problem. And, they, and when they approached um, uh, their partner institutions, the, the response was, but we make money from this. This is the only way we can actually have a, a cost recovery model. Um, what the study basically demonstrated was, was that in almost all of the cases, there, it was not a cost recovery model um, because they weren't adding up all of the costs. So there was money on one side, but the costs were not being added up. In a number of occasions, there wasn't actually a business model at all. I think one of my favorite examples was uh, three institutions. How did you come to your price list, I asked. And they said, ah, well said Institution C. Institution A, everyone thinks they're really expensive, so we have to be cheaper than them. <laughs> institution B is not as important as us, so we must be more expensive than them. And that's how we come to our price list. So absolutely no reference to input costs, output income, and yet they would sit there and say, but we're making 20, 30,000 pounds a year, isn't that good? but if you actually looked at the costs. One of the, 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 the institutions we studied in, studied in this was the um, uh, Museum of Fine Art in Boston, which was, at that time, incredibly renowned for being one of these places that was making really large, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars from their collections. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, but a team of about eight people uh, to run that, and that was not including the, the, the general counsel and the legal team. That was not including the digitization team. That was not including all the people who were moving artworks from, from the exhibition spaces to the digitization teams and then back again. It wasn't including the metadata people. And so it looked like a lot of money, but actually when you accounted all the other things, it, it, it was more or less kind of doing okay, but you know, those aspects. But just to say the reason this isn't easy is, is uh, this report came out. It did make a lot of difference. The community responded very positively to it. But how long did it take for anyone to actually do it? It took time. And this is one of the things that it does take. You know, although you know, it would be very easy for me to sit here and say, oh, look what the Americans have done. Isn't it incredible? You should all be doing the same. Just appreciate it took them time. It wasn't an overnight thing, and you do need to have a process of decision making to think through what you're going to do. So I'm going to talk about some of that. Because of that report, I was able to be working with them, and I understood what they were doing and some of the things that went underneath. And so you have here the Metropolitan Museum of Art putting uh, lots of public domain images available in Creative Commons, and they used uh, CC0. Um, and I'm going to glance at the tape. Does it say? Yes, that's 2017. So 2004, my report, 2017, the Met Open Access. Okay, Just because people were convinced this was a good thing to do didn't mean that they could just get on and do it along those lines. One of the things that was a debate within the, within the Met was uh, should they go CCBY or should they go CC0? And, um, uh, and it was interesting to be in part of some of the internal conversations there where they were kind of saying, well, look, you know, we do, you know, our shops make money from the sale of, of, of objects and things like that. And so the licensing of that does bring us money in. Should we go CCBY? Because that would enable us to hold on to that type of revenue, et cetera. And actually, they did a little bit of business modeling internally inside of their institution. And they looked across at all of their activities and they did a sort of return on investment. And they went, Actually, we have about 300 shops around the world. We're one of those airport, play, airport shops that you have, you know, um, and we sell an awful lot of things. And yes, the shop is where we make a lot of revenue. But we also spend a really large amount of time and effort 
in all of those licensing conversations we have with all of those suppliers, um, where we make a much bigger margin off the product that we sell in the shop than we do off of the licensing agreement that we have with them as suppliers. And so, yes, if they sell you know, those mugs somewhere else, they're making money that we're not getting. But if we sell their mugs in our shop, or if we sell you know, their, their, their postcards or whatever it is in our shop, we're making money along those lines. But what we could do, if we went from C to CC0, if we actually took that extra step and go to CC0, is we stop having to worry about the licensing. So we stop having to talk to all those academics who want to have this in their book. We have to stop having to talk to all the publishers. We stop having to have these ongoing conversations with suppliers about, well, you know, you can do this, you can't do that, you can do this, you can't do that. And also, this has to be renewed. Oh, and now you want to sell it in Africa. Okay, now that's a different deal than the one where we used to have it in Asia, and now we need to do it. Just removed a whole tranche of work. And they went, that was worth it. They did the cost-benefit um, uh, uh, relationship there and said, that's worth it to us. So actually, their, their internal decision-making um, was both altruistic, make this material available, that's what we're here for as a, as a museum. But they also looked at their internal ways of working and realised that they, were, um, uh, they could uh, reassign people to more useful things um, in, uh, that would have more impact rather than uh, constantly churning through licences. Um, and note, I'm not speaking on behalf of these institutions, I'm speaking from my personal experience of some of these conversations, so I don't want them to feel like they're being committed by anything I'm saying here. Um, the Smithsonian very recently uh, released 2.8 million images into the public domain. And what was really exciting about um, the Smithsonian release was that this wasn't just art images. This was science and nature and technology and all sorts of uh, content being release, released into um, the, uh, the public domain. And I just want to very, very quickly reflect um, that... Uh, their decision-making there was about legacy agreements. One of the difficulties they had was that, that each little bit of the Smithsonian, because it's such an enormous organisation, had lots of legacy agreements with publishers, with broadcasters, um, and, all, and often those legacy agreements were like, well, you'll exclusively work with the BBC, you'll exclusively work with HBO, you'll exclusively work with... And they had to untangle all of those bits because of they were exclusive agreements, which didn't allow them to do things. And so, again, legacy decisions you've made in the past are things that will drive you in the future. But one of the great things about this is that they've now got this metrics dashboard. So it also lent into their values of being able to say, we want to be open, we want to be accessible, we want this material to be used. It's helpful to the Smithsonian to have nature, science, and technology as part of their remit, because open is a natural way of working in those, in those STEM industries uh, and STEM societies. And so this is a way for them to be open about their, their resources. Uh, I also worked uh, with the US National Gallery of Art. I uh, helped them develop their digital strategy um, uh, about uh, sorry, 2019. Um, and the National Gallery of Art had gone open earlier than, than many other uh, museums and galleries in the US, um, but they hadn't gone um, fully open uh, and hadn't gone uh, to CC0. And one of the big issues for them uh, as internally in terms of the discussions when I was discussing with colleagues was control. Control was one of the, 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 the big issues. Um, so let's look at the outcomes of them going CC0 and I'll give you a chance to sort of, sort of glance at that while, while I talk about that. So one of their concerns was if we make our materials available in the way that the Smithsonian do, does, etc., and that ends up on something like Wikimedia, how will we track where it is, and how will we track what people are doing with it, and what if someone says something that's not right about our painting? Note the our painting. My painting, not the nation's, mine. <laughs> I'm the curator, this is my painting, I'm the one who knows what it means. I'm the one who should say what it, what it means. And only people with authority should have any ability to say what that painting means. And that was a real worry. I hear it again and again and again. This is not just a couple of people in the National Gallery of Art. This is, this is something you hear all, all over. Actually, from the National Gallery's perspective, and when you talk to the people, that sense of control actually isn't a, 
you know, I made, I made it sound worse than it is. It isn't a only I can say something. It's a fear of getting something wrong. It's a fear of misrepresenting something in the record. It's understanding that when they say something, it carries the weight of a nation. It's the National Gallery. So that fear. But they've been able to track it. They've been go, able to go online. Um, uh, 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 ben Zweig here has said, in January 2020, the 25 most viewed gallery donated images received around 1.5 million impressions on Wikipedia whereas the same images received just over 1,000 views on the gallery's website. And so it's orders of magnitude um, bigger in terms of the reach and uh, those aspects. But there are a series of challenges here. You know, we all understand that we have curation challenges we have to deal with and that this is an unfunded mandate. There is not a lot of money out there to transfer into digital and we're all worried about money. Part of the reason that we're worried about money, I would say, is because of the way our selection criteria works. So sometimes it would be great if we said our values, our audiences, and our information goals are built with our communities. We identify co collections. We plan the most effective route, and then we seek funding. But in reality, it's often the other way around. Here's a little bit of money. What would we do with that money? Oh, here's a collection I think is really cool. And then we'll try and convince the community they wanted it in the first place. Um, that is often part of it. We want to make our data fair and care. So again, fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Care, collect, collective of benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. When you start working with indigenous peoples or indigenous collections, then you start actually getting to people saying, well, I want to restrict access to this, or I don't want that person to have access to this you then get another stakeholder group coming in and saying, what does control look like? What does access look like around that? We've got some prompts, though, some things that should be encouraging us. You know, the European Commission, uh, with its European strategy for data, it's the concept of data spaces, um, and focusing on putting people first in developing technology and, defend, and defending and promoting European values and rights in the digital world. Now, that's an incredibly important central driver which is going to be impacting on uh, nation governments and is going to be impacting on everyone who is uh, a public institution within a nation government. And so responding to that positively, responding to the opportunity of data spaces is going to be very important. Um, I noticed just, just this morning uh, Louis Ramos uh, Pinto's uh, piece on Portugal's um, museum collections and the challenges and contradictions there uh, in reuse. And this is just to note again some of the challenges. And the UK hasn't got this right. I'm not here saying, oh, the UK, we do it, we do it all right. We're still working through this. But I would really recommend everyone go and read this incredible report by Andrea Wallace, A Culture of Copyright, which is a scoping study on open access. There is more data here than you can ever want. And there is more insight into the way that you can build your decision making to guide you through your processes that you could ever, ever need. So I just finally want to talk about values very, very quickly and say that in decision making, the most important thing for your institution is your values. Now, I've talked about this in the BVI model in terms of modes of digital value, um, and you can find information about that at the bvimodel.org. But I think this is really about engaging with uh, uh, understanding that you as memory institutions and your digital resource collections um, are engaged in intangible values, which don't connect in a simple, um, I, I make this image available, money appears. It's I make this image, image available, and that engages with intangible values such as knowledge, social memory, education, brand recognition for your institution, uh, or goodwill. And those are the things that will drive potential income in the future, much more than just a retail model um, in that sense. And I also think this is about impact and trying to think what difference does your museum make in the world. And there are lots of areas of impact, and we'll make these slides available, so I'm going to, I'm going to not spend much time here. But if you're thinking about these areas of impact, can you then think about how you might measure those, how you might see what matters 
to your communities, see how what you do connects with them in different ways, and then think about how um, open could possibly lead to innovation. Um, so in this, this case, the Rice Studio, they did awards where they said, come up with innovative products based on our artworks. Um, and you can sell them. We don't want your money. We want you to innovate. We're actually generating income into our local community by people innovating. So you reach more people and you make a diff bigger difference. And if you can do those things, then you've got the real reward here, which works at a national level, which is if you can demonstrate your impact, you can link that impact to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and your government cares about that. So that is a big win that you can have by taking these steps through. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon, for this very inspiring appetizer, <laughs> let's say. I would now give the floor to Trilse. And uh, I think we, we, we do all the speeches and then uh, we start the discussion and also questions if there are. Hmm? Can What's you up? help me? I thought I had a PDF. Because you uh, yes. had a PDF. Uh, no. What's it, what's, it, what's it trying to do? No. And then if you open uh, here and find it in the finder, maybe? Is it in the desktop? Yeah, there you go. Where it is? Unlocking. Yeah, yeah but I think it's uh, open with all the uh, with. Uh, um, uh, no, Sorry. because this is a very nice uh, new. Yeah, uh, I have the software a little loaded yet. Okay. No. Can I give you then the PowerPoint? The PP, yes, the PPT. Can I borrow your. Uh, Just a technical problem with <laughs> proprietary software. <laughs> No, because we don't have enough, even out of the there. I thought that would be easier. Can I borrow you? Yeah, I'm just checking where it is. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Mine got reformatted. And, oh. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Should we maybe go with Matthias or something while I figure this out? <laughs> but I think we have time. I mean, we are just losing. Losing time. Yeah. Because okay, sometimes you can open it with. You should be able to open it in Chrome, actually. Let me see if I'll do it. Here you go. Ah, thank you. It worked. Thank you. Okay. Do you know how to make it a presentation? I am mode? just trying to work that out now. Thank you. Uh, keep, keep going with yours in case this doesn't work. I think it's where's, where's, it's F, where's F11? F11? Uh, uh, nope. <laughs> but, um, how do you make it a presentation? Yeah, I'm just trying to make it full screen.
Okay, sorry about that. So imperfect slides, but you get the idea. Um, so thank you very much for the invite. I'm really happy to be here also because I started my fascination with Wikipedia a number of years ago. In 2017, we downloaded the entire English Wikipedia and we looked at all of the images that were available in articles from museums, libraries and archives. And that was really fun to see that indeed museums could reach out beyond their collection websites. As Simon said, you know, the relationship between the viewers you get on your website and the viewers you get in Wikipedia is uh, of another order. And so I'm really happy to continue our collaboration with Wikipedia and um, uh, now with Italy. And so we'll see what wonderful things we do. So thank you, Enrico and University for the invite. And I'm really happy also to be here with colleagues that I appreciate working with. Um, so today I'll be talking about my work. Uh, um, this is part of my larger research. Um, so coming from that idea on, okay, museums are digitizing, what happens to their collections. As Simon said, you know, we know a little bit what uh, audiences want, but what is the value proposition? Um, or maybe I should, let's see how we do this, like that. It works okay, yeah? Um, so the idea is maybe let's look at a specific group of individuals, and these are creators, not the general public. We're only interested in individuals that are creating things with the collection. Here, there's an example on the left of um, um, a software or a program, let's say, that is a clock. And so this is about, what, 225 or so, 220 something. Um, and the system finds objects that have these lines. So you see the leg goes to the 25 and the loot neck goes into the two hours, more or less. And so the system identifies the images based on these main lines to set you know, the clock. Oh yeah, sorry, it's one right there, it's 124. Um, so I was really curious on this group for one reason. And I was again inspired by Wikimedia and Wikipedia. Um, imagine if we really take it seriously, this idea that heritage information is part of a nation's asset. And so if we start with this proposition, we know that we must take care of our physical collections because it's our national asset, but also our intangible information collections because this is part, again, of our assets. So how does that work? If the proposition will follow, if we do it right, then we can uh, provide this as infrastructural service for our um, residents so that they um, can go like many other infrastructures, you know, the internet, the electricity, and so on, you know, so that we can do our business, um, thanks to all of these benefits from the uh, infrastructure. So imagine if we could do the same with heritage information. And so looking at makers or creators, it was the easiest starting point to look at, okay, if we provide this, what happens? Um, we also came to the uh, conclusion after a number of research that the notion of culture is changing. And so when we think of digital culture, we have to really discuss what do we mean. And, in, and so, so culture is not one. We have performing arts on one side, gaming industry on another side. You know, they're all quite different. And when you translate them digitally, they also translate differently. So we read eBooks, no problem. Maybe we listen to uh, Spotify, no problem. But what is a digital museum? A, a, a kind of a problem. Um, and so there's a number of things that we need to sort of discuss um, before we can get better data. And I see that maybe you cannot see all the text, but well, sorry about that. I'm not sure. This one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So this is, um, and, and, and considering that we're discussing um, infrastructure, we need a large approach, otherwise, you know, it, it doesn't really work. And so what did we, well, before what we do, and so we know, what do we know? Not very much. 
Um, there's been some European stats that try to figure out how much have we digitized. And so um, they say it's about 13% of collections that are online. How, how come so little? Copyright is always to blame for, but we know that only a third of collections might have some form of uh, restriction. So what happens to the rest? Um, you know, most of our collections are older than that. And so, and you know, there's a number of things that we know that uh, collections are not only restricted by that. So there's other issues going on. Um, when we ask, okay, how are these used or how much of it is used? We don't know. The question in the last survey was, do you have, uh, do you capture uh, online stats? And one third of institutions say yes, but they weren't asked how many visitors you have. And of the few that answer, um, it's just really messy. You know, web stats are all over the place yet. We haven't had a really a harmonization system. Um, another important point is that the um, um, GLAMs continue to work in a broadcasting mode, meaning here's a wonderful exhibit, you should come. Here's our wonderful collection online, you should come and see it. Well, that's a little bit old-fashioned, so we want to do it differently. Um, we know that the best collections of 3D are not in a museum. They're in Sketchfab, for instance. Um, and we know that consumers that are interested in this digital content, they want, as Simon already said, ease of access. Give me what I want in the format I want it, in the moment I want it. Um, ideally, they want a standardized system because if you go to each museum website and try to download their 3D, it's a mess. It's better if you just go to Sketchfab and download the 3D. It doesn't matter from what museum. And they also like the options of sharing because you're not going to stay in Sketchfab. You're using this platform so that you can take it back to whatever other project you're working on. So the big idea is to work provide these collections as if they were a Lego. You know, Lego, it has three colors. You have like four or six or whatever, and then, you know, you can build castles with it. So imagine if our collections were sort of played, uh, positioned in this way online so that creators could do whatever they wanted to. Um, there was a study from Nesta 2019 that asked, how much are you collaborating with others? Are you investing in research and innovation? Um, the orange is the overall sector. The purple is the museums, libraries, and archives. And you see a very clear um, leg in behind. Um, questions such as, um, for instance, we actively seek to share our experience with peers outside the organization, or we engage in experimentation and take risk with digital technology. You see a noticeable gap. What's going on here? We have a very traditional sector, or we have maybe different kind of goals. So that's why we decided, OK, we cannot reach all the creators of the Netherlands in this case. Let's start from our peers, so GLAMs, and let's ask them what they think. We interviewed about, well, we gathered data from about um, 100 creators in four different steps. And we identified four main ways in which digital connections are being used. The first profile, well, maybe I should start. The first profile, if those individuals and creators that don't use digital collections as a principle. <laughs> um, however, they do have access in other ways, etc., but not linked to their art form. And they're very clear about it, and they're very aware, and that's it. This is an interesting group, maybe for future collaborations. The other three profiles, first one is the, creative pro the digital as part of the creative process in that, for instance, they will scroll Instagram and find some images, or they will go into um, you know, Google, or they go into these pri generally private um, services to get inspiration on how others are using, or you know, memes where you can have multiple layers of knowledge and are really um, creative. It's a um, favorite of some of the makers. Um, you will see that if museums were to satisfy this group, you need to think about how to position content so that it's searchable and reusable in this way. A second group um, is more interested into using the collections as a direct input for their work. Uh, Jesse Mokrin, for instance, I don't know if you know her, she takes 
um, she does literal um, reflections on paintings, and so um, she takes very famous object uh, pieces and makes them um, her style. Uh, so it's often very cropped images, as you see here, um, and very large size. Um, Silke Schoenfeld, she's a um, um, filmmaker, and she takes also stories from collections and makes them into film. And so for these kind of artists, they want also very specific uh, search options to find exactly what they're looking for. Um, whoops, the other side. Um, and there's the other group that looks at um, collections as data. Um, so, for instance, the Studio Bartel, the Studio Lauter, the middle image, um, they took all of the data from archives in terms of from the Netherlands, um, international movement of goods in the 17th century, um, and they visualized what that would look like, how, many, how large the ship, how many individuals, how many uh, objects, how many this type of thing. Um, and another superposition is, again, this um, uh, looking at the collections that match other criteria, for instance, the clock or, for instance, these vertical lines. So again, for these, you need other type of data in other format for artists and creators to, to look at. Um, and so if we go with a Lego idea, what would that look like? So if we can imagine a commons of cultural heritage, um, it will be like an infrastructure um, that doesn't really give us what we already know, but it should be able to allow us to create something different, something better. Um, that it facilitates our work, um, that is able to stimulate also these uh, networks, um, that is of ours, is our heritage, reflects our identity and strengthens our identity. And it's also for us, so it's from us and for us. But just like that, if it's so much about us, then it also depends on us to develop it. And so that's kind of the idea. Um, you probably have heard there's a few uh, documents and also grants from the Commission stimulating um, participatory ownership. Um, then, well, maybe I'll mention this also later on. We're part of a project that deals with this. Um, uh, this commons of cultural heritage um, should allow not only these reuse possibilities, but should also have um, a number of um, uh, agreements in the group. Like, for instance, um, if we're working bottom-up, you should use some form of standard so that, I mean, Lego, they decided what their format was, but we still don't have a format for sharing our collections and for reusing them. Uh, Simon also alluded earlier to this issue that maybe an image has or a heritage piece has a meaning for a group of society but maybe it has a different meaning for a different group of society. And here I'm thinking maybe different generations, urban, rural, um, and so on and so forth, different cultural backgrounds or different uh, perceptions. And both should have the possibility to engage and, and, and reuse this. But the question is, are there frameworks for safe reuse that are respectful of the other? Or you know, how do we go about this? So that's a whole other question. And well, just an indication that you can also work with some of these uh, larger institutions. Um, then we were looking at some of the examples on how in the Netherlands we see these collaboration with makers. And we found three main formats of collaboration. So the first one is the commission. Um, it's generally one-on-one -on -one relationship um, where the commissioner uh, can be the institution or the uh, government. Here's an example of a pop singer that was invited by the Mauritz House uh, to make a song from one of the paintings. And so many other paintings have their pop song. Um, uh, many questions about, you know, what do we get out of that, but okay. Another model is this collaborating in the um, more general sense. The example here is the National Library of the Netherlands that identified their uh, medieval images, some that are interesting for making memes. And so you can make your own meme of the Middle Ages. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and the idea is here, this is one example, but um, maybe the format is this open call where you say, you know, this is the collections, please feel free to do. Uh, similar is the case that Simon mentioned earlier with the um, Rijksmuseum Open Studio that you say, here's the collection, please do your thing. And, you know, maybe we give prizes and then in this way we know what people uh, do. Um, another model is this hackathon. Um, this is a little bit more high tech in that not everybody is comfortable with it, um, but generally is um, uh, for other sectors, not so much for creative uh, content. Um, it's used sometimes for cleaning up the metadata and these kind of things, but not for developing a new um, service or a new cultural good, let's say. Uh, and generally, if you're familiar with this, um, is uh, you have a time limit, you have a specific goal, and then a number of people that come together with multiple skis to create something. There's been some nice hackathons in the Netherlands um, using cultural collections. Um, from this research, one of the results was that makers like the idea. There's many ethical questions. They also are really afraid of the legal um, and the technical and the, uh, the actual pragmatic uh, issues. And for these, they um, suggested to have um, sort of one portal where, first of all, they could find each other, but they could also get um, a little bit of uh, skills for knowing how to reuse collections. Um, in terms of what might we get out of this? Um, we know that we humans create based on the content we have previously experienced. This is a case of a um, um, uh, Norwegian um, artist. Um, a second Norwegian artist has taken a, an element of the painting and developed a whole object that you can uh, purchase in the museum. Uh, so this is one of the easiest ways to stimulate this reuse uh, within the museum shop. Um, we're actually part of a um, participatory business model uh, project in um, part of the European Commission. Um, what is it called? Recharge. <laughs> I thought you were going to use the recharge in your slide, but you didn't. Uh, yeah. Um, and this project is very much trying to stimulate this notion that if we might not only think of uploading the images for sale directly, but we can also think of like a visa. Huh? There's a two-market, uh, two-sided market. So on the one side, you can have free access to the information, but on the other side, or like Google, huh? you sell something else. And one of these uh, sell something else that we're trying to uh, explore now with uh, Recharge is developing this collaboration with makers so that if the uh, object gets picked up and if it gets sold, maybe the museum can have, um, you know, a share sort of the exploitation of it. Um, Regarding um, institutions, I think for institutions it's tricky to want to let go. Um, they also have to um, be aware of um, and the benefits uh, that can be brought by makers. And one major benefit is that the long tail, the lost pieces in the collection could be rediscover and some wonderful things could happen. This is an example of um, an archive, uh, some um, crazy artist dug into the archive and found a super cool story about this girl. She was so touched by it that she made an entire theater piece out of it. And so out of uh, a couple of pieces of the archive, this uh, major um, you know, performance that was um, uh, performed in Leiden in the theater and et cetera. So you see that the collections can be extremely rich, but we might not always in the museums or in the libraries and archives be able to explode, explore all of its potential. So that's why reuse could also benefit uh, this part of things. Um, and I guess these are the main ideas. I leave you, I think um, it's about time for me to end. I leave you the, um, this is of course I had to pick because it's part of the, it's a Mexican collection. <laughs> and somehow they found this and I have all the links here. I will share later on with my slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. I think you have provided a very 
large and wide and perspective on uh, reuses, but also you mentioned at the very beginning of your presentation uh, uh, the issue of uh, how to measure the reuses, uh, these uh, uh, uses and reuses in the digital worlds. Uh, that is a, a big question mark for the uh, for the cultural institutions, and I think this topic, it's uh, this uh, issue, is uh, actually uh, very connected to what Matthias Sali uh, will be presenting. Because uh, I mean, Simon and Trils uh, have presented more the let's say the um, cultural institution perspective, but uh, Matthias here is presenting. I think one of the most uh, original research uh, in this challenging field of uh, how to understand how images uh, in the digital world are reused, especially of cultural institutions. Thank you. That's already on. Yeah. So also, uh, well, welcome from my side. Um, thanks a lot for the organization and organizers. Um, great uh, special session so far and very interesting. So the research question, as I said, um, directly falls in line with a project that was um, just recently um, conducting. And the research idea here is, uh, is very simple. It's actually what happens um, with the digitization of museum collections um, in connection with the copyright. So what is the impact of the copyright on terms of uh, availability of online collections? and why basically um, sometimes you can read, sorry, no images available. So um, this is joint work with Alexander Kunz from, from WIPO as well, with Paul Hield from the University of Illinois. And I should mention the WIPO uh, disclaimer, so WIPO is the World Intellectual Property Organization and it's part of the UN, and uh, the views expressed are those of the authors and not member states or um, the UN itself. So. Simply put, the research question that we asked here, um, by the way, so my background is economics and um, even worse, I'm an empirical economist. That means I try to simplify as much the, um, the research outcome that we have. It's very, it's, part of it is a very technical um, research, but um, I think the, the results um, can be explained a bit more in a broader sense. So the research question that we asked here is what happens when an artwork falls into public domain in terms of availability um, and so the distribution in the market actually and the quality and if I say quality that means the digital image resolution so the uh, digital artwork quality. Um, the question I think is interesting in so far that it's actually not very clear um, whether at all an artwork should become available. Um, that's, I think, way more in your expertise, actually, what are the incentives of museums to actually, at first place, to digitize something. Because they can be seen as a, as a gatekeeper of the artwork, and um, so they are, um, depending on private or cultural um, or public institutions, maybe, um, so they're in, the, in, 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 um, in possession of the tangible object, and they might decide just simply not to digitize or um, make it available. And second, um, it might have something to do with their um, with their um, strategy, for example, in terms of income. So they might uh, just simply decide, for example, to only make digital artworks available in lower quality or not at all available because they um, they want to have uh, museum visitors. Um, on site, maybe it's it's the the better uh, source of income for them. So I would say all of this makes it very interesting from a research point of view. And the only um, available um, literature that we conducted pr um, most like um, most probably was um, in the relationship between the public domain status of a creative work and um, the availability was in the book market. Um, so. Um, in Kedheimer's Hills and many more were conducting studies there. And overall, I would say what the research says is that once the creative work falls into public domain, the supply um, basically increases, um, most likely to higher competition and lower transaction costs, and which is leading to um, lower prices. And in general, the availability increases. Um, so 
insofar, I would say this is my for you, maybe not super surprising. You can say, um, okay, something falls into public domain and it becomes more available. But on the other hand, from an economic point of view, you could also say, yeah, who should have an interest in making something available that's in the public domain in the book market? Because um, book markets are usually commercially driven. So I think the nevertheless the research is very interesting here. So um, overall, but I would say there's definitely a clear empirical gap in uh, the visual art sector and dig digital artwork images, and we are trying to add a piece here, a research piece um, to this question. So overall, what I already can say is that we find um, a significant and large increase in availability when visual artworks are in the public domain. Overall, we find what we call a considerable um, downstream reuse. That basically means where are those artworks reused in the World Wide Web? And I propose a valuation method in terms of dollar amount um, that I will come to in, in some minutes. So, okay, to say, um, to conduct empirical research, you need to have data. And our starting point was museum.org, um, which is um, an online source that is collecting digital artwork images, rather focusing on popular artworks in kind of a community activity that is going on there. So they um, link from various sources, from the museums, from Wikimedia um, and, uh, and other web pages, the digitized artworks. And on top of that, we are also able to observe, for example, the amount of page views that an artwork receives and as well the amount of clicks um, and likes and so on that the artwork receives, which is very interesting. We, we can have a, a kind of a control measure in terms of popularity of those artworks. So we take those artworks and as a next step, as an econometrician, so statistics for um, economists, is you need to have a causal identification strategy. And in natural science, this is might a bit easier because you take an object, so something, and you treat the object um, and you have a control object um, that is basically the same and then you compare um, the outcomes and the differences then the causal impact of your treatment. In social science, this is a bit more complicated. So as you might know, so you need to have something like a quasi natural experiment. Um, in our setting, that was basically um, exogenous variation in copyright protection that is called. So that basically is um, uh, the um, Sony Bono Copyright um, Term Extension Act in the United States in 1998 that um, I hope no lawyers are among us. So um, very simply put, that, ex um, that extended the copyright protection, so the maximum amount of copyright protection that you can have from 75 to, to 95, retrospective for artworks that were published. So here we have to be um, a bit specific. It's not created in 1923. It's published in 1923. But what is publication of, uh, of an artwork that's a bit more difficult? So we approximate the publication with the creation date of the artwork itself. And so what happens is that um, around this cliff in 23, um, artworks that were created before um, remained in the public domain, while artworks created afterwards gained an additional 20 years of protection. So you can have uh, um, a cliff that was made um, retrospectively. So in 98, they decided for art was created then um, have kind of a treatment in terms of copyright protection. So this is interesting from, from an econometrician point of view. And so because this um, change in law was in the United States, um, we narrowed down the main data to artworks from US museums and around this cliff that I was pointing to, so between 1910 and 1914. And the very, very descriptive and simple data here is already pretty clear. So around the cliff that I was just referring to, you see something is going on and actually what is going on there, you can make use of that and quantify and can say, okay, the jump here um, from the research design is um, the causal impact of the artworks moving from in copyright to public domain. And this is what we tried. And the simple idea behind this research um, model, I think, is cool because it can be explained very easy. So we again have this cliff that I was just referring to. Um, 
that, by the way, shifted to 26 by the time when we collected um, the data. So don't be confused. I referred before to 23, but when we collected the data was some years later, so the cliff um, changed to 26. So what we measure is um, a bit in a more complicated way, but like let it put it that way. So this is kind of an average of the amount of artworks that we observe per artist in a, in a given creation year. And if something is going on in this, um, in this figure um, that we can relate to the copyright status that is changing, so from copyright in to public domain, and if we observe a discontinuity, so a jump in the availability upwards and downwards, we can relate the change to the copyright status itself. So, and this is uh, indeed the case. So roughly 40% percent in, um, forty percentage increase on average, so per artist and creation year, we do see, um, see this jump actually. So artworks seem to be more available when they are in the public domain. And very briefly, so one robustness check of this identification strategy is you can have a look at the exact same um, cliff, so at the same date, 26 here in that case, and you try to understand whether other variables, for example, the page views or the likes that the artworks received, also do have kind of a discontinuity. If there is a discontinuity, it's actually a bad sign. That means that artworks in the public domain, for example, are way more popular compared to in copyright artworks or the other way around. So simply put, um, if you would have ob observed a discontinuity, you would compare apple with pears. And so um, this is kind of a reassuring result and it's actually good for our strategy is you don't really observe any um, differences in, in page views or popularity. If something, then maybe you can say, um, in copyright artworks received a little bit more um, likes, but on the other hand, um, public domain artworks on average received a bit more page, uh, page views. And by the way, here we're talking about um, millions of page views that we all put together in a model and create simple um, interpretable um, results. So as a next step, um, what we did is that we took those artworks from the US museums, um, so specifically the links of those artworks, and we put it in a Google reverse image search. I'm not sure if you've ever done it, but it's actually quite a fascinating tool to use. So you take the link and put it in this machine, and then the machine gives you um, the results of um, not only where this specific image has been reused in the World Wide Web, but as well the visual um, similar artworks. In our case, we excluded um, the visual or similar artworks because we were interested in this specific artwork from Met created in 25, for example, or 20, 20, 2020 or so, um, 1920, sorry, um, will be or is reused where. And not only where, but also as well um, in terms of quality, so the, the, the image resolution that I was referring to earlier. So. What happened in the end is that we started off with around 1,600 um, artworks around this specific cliff. So please note that we only look at like the very cliff around 1926 of um, artwork creation dates. And we ended up with uh, roughly 90,000 uh, reuses in the World Wide Web, which is quite a considerable amount of downstream reuse that you actually observe. And most of this reuse um, was on um, was commercially driven, so that means that we found that the artwork itself was on a .com web page, and um, roughly one third was uh, was on a, based on a country code, so .it for example, and so on. Um, the next step, what you can do is uh, what economists sometimes call um, back off the envelope calculations. That basically means that you're not comfortable with your um, uh, calculations and you you run estimates of uh, like a valuation method that you're sure it's just an approximation, but it's maybe the best that you can do in terms of dollar amounts. Um, because we were interested in what is this um, reuse that we observed of those 1,500 artworks worth. Um, and the very simple method based on, but simply but like interesting and good, based on methods uh, proposed by Heald and Ericsson, is that you take the number of amount of artworks that you observe, you have the average of 
commercial and non-commercial reuse that you observe, and you multiply this by a factor of um, a dollar amount. In our case, we started with, with for example, um, the licensing amount uh, in terms of dollars that you had to pay at get the images for a commercial and non-commercial reuse, and you end up with estimates that sold the museum database, for example, could be valued at over 700 million US dollars. Um, for commercial reuse or non-commercial reuse, um, which has a, a lower fee for, um, for a licensing fee, basically, for, of around 60 millions. So, in interesting time, very briefly, um, the next step, I, 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 I told you that we were interested in the image uh, resolution of those results. What we found in the United States was um, a guide by the museum's directors um, something, um, Association of Art Museum Directors, so that was the term, so I can read it here. And what they said is that we're going to give you um, a threshold of image quality that we would say, so as the association, um, that could be considered fair use. So, um, that basically means that you can use copyright protected material, material for educational purposes and we would say it's not a copyright infringement. So if you go below this threshold line, so the horizontal line in this, in this figure, um, we would say it's, called, uh, it's, it's considered a fair use, while above a very high quality um, um, reuse of something that's might copyright protected could, um, could end up in violation of copyright. And the other line, the vertical line you can see here is again the difference between copyright prote um, protected artworks or public domain artworks. And first of all, unsurprisingly, is what we observe that we observe extremely many um, public domain artworks in low quality because overall the internet is, is full of um, low quality images, so that's not really a surprising result. So this is an overlay plot, so the darker it gets, the more data sits behind there, so it's, it's thousands of, of images that we compare here. But as well, you do observe like extremely many, extremely high quality uh, reuses. So the like top left, for example, that would mean an artwork created in 1910 is um, published in extremely high quality. That means you can zoom in and can see like, differences in the eyes of, for example, of, uh, of an artwork, um, if an eye would be on it. Um, as a next step, the copyright protected artworks, indeed, we found that just a few outliers were um, published in high resolution, while the vast majority was published in, um, in, um, in low quality. It actually means that they seem to, so the museums somehow seem to accept um, this threshold guideline um, this proposed uh, um, threshold um, line by the by the association. So I think um, I leave the conclusion because we're going to upload the results. And I thought that it might would be interesting that I had a look as well um, at the data in the Italian um, context. And what I find is that um, for artists um, from Italy. Uh, worldwide um, digitized artworks that we found that we observe an extremely increase um, for artworks created before 1800. So maybe you will be able to put this a bit more in a co um, context. And the other line is um, artworks that were digitized and published by Italian museums, but the, the lines look more or less the same. And as a next step in terms of popularity that I had a look as well. So the top names are not really um, surprisingly, but as well that um, both um, artists um, from Italy elsewhere, but as well um, artworks from Italian museums seem to be very popular in terms of uh, um, views. Um, so it's, it, it's in total millions of views that you observe. And it seems to be the case that popularity is, is, is really around um, 1600, around there. But at the, at the same time, also younger artworks seem to be very popular overall. So thanks a lot. This, this was it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation that actually, yes, 
provide some insights into what happened when when uh, uh, when uh, an image of a, an artwork is put in the public domain, but is connected also what happened when it is uh, put in open access. And thanks for the Italian uh, uh, the Italian case that uh, I think would be very interesting uh, then to to know which are the, the museum collections that have been uploaded in order to better <laughs> inquire. And I think <laughs> there will be future research uh, possible. So I um, would leave the floor for uh, starting some questions if there are from, uh, from the audience. Uh, we have a mic here that Alice, but also I would like to thank for the supporting the organization of this session. So are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, because it's, uh, no, it's on, yeah. Okay, then I use it. Thank you very much to all of you. I mean, it's impressive presentations. Impressive presentations, um, impressive messages. And I'm still asking myself, digitalizations to what end? Uh, I mean, we are in digitalizations um, a period of uh, uh, development. It's everywhere. Obviously, there's some benefits, but I still, at least what I'm hearing here, we don't know how it's used, with some exceptions. At least Europeana has some um, uh, analysis, surveys about who is using it. It seems very small uh, crowd, which is very specialized, like researchers, uh, students, educators. Um, and we also know that actually it's very costly. So cost benefits here, it's very crucial. Great idea to have infrastructure, but the cost, it's incredible, I think. And there were some uh, attempts to make some estimates what could be. Also, Europeana had uh, analysis that I don't remember the percentage, but higher percent of the institutions actually doesn't have even a strategy of their GLAMS institutions, doesn't have a strategy for digitalization. It's very, now it's very top down. We have to, you have to digitalize. But nobody is clear to what end. Is it end of itself or it's a meaning to another end? And I'm not hearing here a little bit. Uh, like, um, yeah, what's the purpose of all this? Thank you. Thank you to all of you. I mean, you had very, very interesting and rich analysis. You all touched upon uh, this question. Yeah, so, I mean, I think. Um, uh, if, I, if I start from the, the, the other end of the question, which is um, uh, where I would be in complete agreement with you, which is if you don't know why you're digitizing, don't start. Um, you need to have a purpose, you need to have an audience, and you need to know why and how they're going to use it or what um, types of uses you're trying to promote in its use. What I've seen, because I've been involved in this uh, environment since 1997 is we had a period between 1997 and 2004 2005 where if you use the D word you got money um, and there was an awful lot of uh, what I would phrase as if you build it they will come and so yes what I'm trying to propose when I talk about the balanced value impact model is trying to understand your, your communities better, trying to co-create with your communities so that you do have that built in from the beginning. And also, if you're understanding those communities, what you can do is potentially not digitize everything, but digitize the things that are needed. Now, different institutions at different sizes will operate in different environments. So uh, I would point to if you're if you're the if you're the British British Library, for instance, 
Um, their newspaper digitization program, which has got very large volumes of, of, of digitized uh, newspaper, they know exactly who's using them. And they are being used by an incredibly wide um, grouping of people. Um, uh, there's a very high level of use by, by academics. But then actually, if you do the analysis that was done by Trove in Australia on newspaper collections and the British Library, you'll see there's lots of people who are in, the things that people are most interested in are um, murder stories and, um, uh, and hobbies. So um, uh, you have people who are interested in horse racing, people who are interested in um, trains, um, you know, these sorts of things. Are, are highly engaged in, in, in these environments. When um, museums uh, engage their communities in uh, crowdsourcing activities, usually they find that they cannot supply enough data for the demand that's there in their communities to do things with that data. You know, so that's in terms of whether that's transcribing content, whether that's describing content whether that is helping them to create tags for content. Often there is way more enthusiasm in people to do things with that than they can actually churn. And we see this in, in a number of um, uh, the, the, the sort of um, um, uh, uh, sort of crowdsourcing science activities as well. You just, you just can't feed the, 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 the people um, with their enthusiasm quickly enough. And I think it is about finding those, the, the, those communities, understanding um, what they need, because then you can have a measurable outcome at the other end, which you can then point to saying this was worth doing. Um, and so I, so I kind of agree with you. I don't agree with the premise that no one knows how this is being used and no one knows if this is worth it. I think there's lots of people who think that it is worth it and they do know how it's being used. But I think if I was in a starting position and I was trying to create a, how do we go forward from here? You're quite correct. If you don't have a strategy, you don't have a plan. If you don't have a plan, then you're just sort of, all roads will lead somewhere. They might not lead where you want them to go, though. So yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of agreeing and disagreeing at the same time. Not really a question, but a comment on what you were saying. Because uh, when you were uh, talking, I was trying to use the Wayback Machine, because I remember this project from the Smithsonian American History Museum that used uh, a platform that was called History Wired, a few of our favorite things. And they use it to co-curate with the community the new uh, exhibition of the collection of the Smithsonian Museum. So they... Um, they build a database with uh, 500 uh, uh, objects uh, and people can vote and decide uh, what to display online and offline. So it was, a, uh, they have a strategy plan <laughs> and also some specific tool. But I think that this is the key point to have a strategy and to understand uh, uh, how it could be used and why, and uh, also how to, um, involve communities to use what is uh, uh, online or uh, digitized uh, because it is also, uh, I think you also touched this point, it is also a matter of uh, um, cultural appropriation uh, that have to be uh, taken into account when uh, talking about uh, both a historic collection or contemporary production. So uh, this could be a good example of uh, uh, a professional and non-professional use of uh, digi digitization tools. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. I agree that um, sometimes between the high capitals and no, low capitals, you can also have this uh, very interesting, different kinds of reading uh, on, on the on the collections. And actually, I was thinking along the lines of your question on the Smithsonian, and I wanted to ask Matthias. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so your data is from the U.S., but I know less of the U.S. and more of Europe at this moment. And but maybe now since Missione, but it's probably too soon. But Rijks, you know, the Rijks Museum and a few other Dutch institutions and probably a couple of other European institutions have done um, large open data publications. Um, I wonder if you can already catch some of that. Because the question will be, as you know, Enrico also asked, you know, with this Italian uh, top five artists, Modigliani and then Da Vinci, it's like, uh, who's, who's, so is it, the, is it the Louvre collection or like, uh, we, whose collection are we talking about? Um, and so that will be really curious to start to look more specifically uh, who's the one publishing and if this person publishing is actually taking, um, been responsible for changing the market, and a little bit like you're saying, no, that um, because it's this appropriation of the of the content based on availability. So as mentioned earlier, um, now that the Dutch universities have this agreement with large publishing houses that their articles are open. I wonder if there will be an increase in the citations of Dutch associated researchers, not that they're Dutch, myself, but associated with a Dutch institution. And so it will be a similar sort of, um, I mean, I wonder to what extent this availability does lead to greater re reuse and eventually perhaps, you know, having a larger part of the, of the discussion in the market. So, great. Yeah, thank you. The, the quick answer here is, um, uh, you're right, so our study was only on the availability itself, so um, it would be very good to get, go a next step and actually to understand where it has been reused and what people are doing with it. So um, I think that then we would need to co-work at least with cultural economics and like art historians and so on to actually understand where could be the potential value of that digitization process and to look at and to, to measure. Um, I remember that we um, do have the Dijk's Museum, I think, in our data as well. Um, and um, the, the next question is then the Dijk's Museum, as far as I understand it, I, I think that most of their um, collection is already in public domain. So they do have a, like just um, mm -hmm. um, a, like a very large public domain works. The question is then what we were rather interested in, what our contemporary or modern um, museums are doing with the digitization of their artworks because they've like they have probably multiple problems um, from the artist or from I don't know from from from, from many sites that you can maybe infringe upon the, the rights um, and not only copyrights their related rights moral rights um, rights to publicity and uh, it's 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 a difficult landscape to analyze. Uh, hi, uh, if you please can um, uh, tell us something about the um, Italian case of uh, specific tariffs for reproduction. Yes, maybe I, I can uh, <laughs> introduce. Thank <a> you. <laughs> no, well, one point is uh, I think uh, no, the the thing that. Uh, uh, both uh, um, Simon and, uh, and Trisse, uh, but also Matthias, have highlighted is uh, most of the time uh, the decision to make open access uh, or commercialization or control. Uh, in most of the cases at the international level that you have provided, uh, it's up to the institution, basically, at the institutional level. Uh, and also what Simon has, has shown uh, is that uh, one size doesn't fit all because uh, both uh, in terms of institutions and also in terms of what value do you want to um, achieve. And the point, for example, starting from, from uh, the Italian context, this is that we have a very diverse uh, uh, cultural institutions, even if we just think to the museums and not entering into the libraries or the archives, but knowing a bit more the museum sectors and the collections of the museum sectors is, uh, I mean, uh, 
Does also cultural policies, national cultural policies that uh, are basically saying or ev everything can be done uh, in some way like or just non-commercial reuse but uh, for commercial reuse uh, you need the authorization. This is something that can fit everybody do you think or we should have more flexibility uh, because at the moment, uh, for example, Italy, but also like uh, I, as far as I see France, uh, are countries uh, where the public governance model is quite strong that are applying one size fit all for, while in the past, for example, there was more flexibility. And this may hamper this. And the second question is, uh, but possibly also, Simon, a bit you have already uh, addressed this point, can uh, an open access model of uh, Creative Commons licenses like CC0 can coexist uh, with uh, uh, commercial initiatives of uh, digital products uh, in which the museum can uh, take a more entrepreneurial approach? I'm thinking about NFTs uh, or Theresa was also citing uh, collaborations with creators uh, that somehow represent a kind of two-sided markets. So uh, in this case, uh, I, I'm asking more some economic reasoning first of uh, whether national policies, also in your experience, uh, if there are national policies that in your opinion can can be useful to, to well, create a kind of homogeneous setting uh, is this good or it depends on, on uh, it's better to have give more flexibility to the institutions in your opinion? And secondly, if uh, open access models can coexist with uh, a commercial or entrepreneurial attitude to make money with the, or create financial resources, generate financial resources, but in other ways that are compatible also with these two models. Okay. You want to start now? So, yeah, thanks for this question. So uh, maybe I'll refer to a little bit on the example of the Netherlands. Uh, so in the Netherlands, uh, there's the policy now to develop a national infrastructure of uh, information, including heritage uh, collections. Um, and this is organized at a regional level. And so every... Um, uh, what do they call um, district? Let's say has a, a person who you can call to as an institution if you have questions or if you want to get advice on how to go about this, and they help you also get uh, linked to other institutions that are more ahead, uh, or um, perhaps these creators that are interested in reusing your collections and they know what they want, and you know you can get collaboration into that. So actually, it's quite a it's quite a um, supportive. Um, market, let's say, right now for institutions to join the, um, this infrastructure. Um, however, being a little bit critical on this, um, it's all volunteer-based. So the government supports, but there's not really any support. <laughs> and so it's actually a moral support saying, this is a good idea, we're going to do it, and let's see what wonderful things come out. And so part of my research was also to map what is going on. And uh, first of all, you know, as I was also trying to show artists and makers as a very specific group who should be the ones reusing the collections are not yet understanding what they can do, what is available, where can they find it. And so this, um, you know, Sketchfab is easy. We know it. It's all there, 3D, clear. Um, but for the rest, it's extremely complex, and makers don't have the energy to learn every single website. And so they go to Instagram, which is one format, or Sketchbab is one format. Um, so this is, I think, a um, model that is really um, um, idealistic, perhaps, and not yet really delivering. And I will argue to say, because there's not really financial support for it. I think if there was a little bit more resources to, for skill development from the institutions or for developing this um, you know, infrastructure where it could be clear where, where, what's, where could makers find things, uh, that would help. On the other question on what might be some of the um, um, commercialization of these collections, um, actually since 2008, Several institutions in the Netherlands published twice 
they publish with Wiki for free. Their data is open data and is, uh, you know, Wiki open, let's say. And they also publish with other private portals that are very expensive and they are meant to, um, they're for publication. So there are these large image banks where newspapers or, you know, very commercial agencies find. So I need a picture of a person that's looking this way with such background. Do you have it? And of course, museums have, our, our libraries and archives, they have any image you want. I suspect this service will change because of our friends that make any image you want on the spot, right? But with a command. And so I suspect new forms of uh, double market could work. So for instance, still, I would suggest still the open because who's gonna search in Wikipedia? You know, me, I do that, but not many people. Um, whereas there could be other places where content could be repackaged um, for a different service. And this is the thing, we know if you have, a, as a museum, a large format, um, then you could sell a black and white or a smaller format or a, you know, a, a different ver a version and it's just really cheap. And this versioning, but for that you need a more commercial mind. So now my research is actually on museum shops. What is the museum selling? I was just in the uh, Edizio and they're wonderful, but they're Postcards are limited, which is so easy. They have all the pictures from the data sets. They could just make postcards of everything. Come on. Or, you know, if you want a uh, publish on demand. So I like this picture, just give me the postcard at that moment so they don't have all the cost of storage. That should be so easy. And somehow, you know, it's one euro. Anybody can buy that. So I think in terms of scale, that could be an idea. But museums are still debating their commercial side as a viable option in their functioning. So I think the problem is more on that side than on the open data and potential uh, reuse of the collections. Thank you. Yeah, this is a very good question. I'm, I'm not sure I've got a really good structured answer for it in that sense. So I, th I think that um, uh, national structures and national regulatory frameworks and um, uh, define a lot of the response to this. And then what I see is museum structures and museum approaches define response to this as well. And, and I'll try and give, give some examples of, of what I mean. Um, if you're a museum which is getting mainly your funding from uh, a government agency or from a regional agency um, that gives you um, uh, it creates a motivation that your only client is that body not the public um, and all you have to please is that government body um, so all you have to do is meet their KPIs and they will keep giving you money and that's a very comfortable place to be and then you look at your commercialization as being nice money on top to do to give you freedom to do the things you want to do rather than being a being a, a singular imperative in that in that sense so national and institutional structures um, involved with that we also then see in some structures so i could point to uh, uk national museums where they have the uh, government funding for footfall coming through coming through um, but it's free so you don't have to pay to get into the National Gallery, you don't have to pay to get into Tate Britain or Tate Modern, you know, those sorts of things. And, but they're getting money from a, a central source. Um, and uh, until COVID, they weren't getting, um, uh, uh, there was a very small proportion of that um, central money which was relating to digital footfall. Um, and uh, and but it, that was taken into account, obviously, because during COVID there was no uh, physical footfall, so the digital became more important. And we suddenly saw a whole bunch of museum directors popping up on the radio saying, "Hey, this digital thing's incredible, isn't it? We're suddenly engaging with our communities in ways we've never been before." And I'm kind of like going, "I've been doing this in the 1990s, <laughs> and you're only just catching on." Um, and probably half their staff were exactly feeling the same way too. And that was 
a direct response to where your money comes from defines what you think is important as an institution. Um, and the other realities is your internal structures. So, you know, I once had a, you know, a, um, uh, a, a museum director who was very much joking, saying, you know, what we want from our average user is for them to turn up in the, in the gallery, wander through very quickly, and then spend most of their time in the cafeteria and the shop. Because um, those are the only bits we can monetize from them. We can't monetize them hanging around in the gallery. So we'd rather they just left that to the people who really care about the art and just went straight to the, straight to the shop. And again, um, what you then see is you then see museum structures where they've either outsourced or they've in-house outsourced um, the operations of those shops or the, opera or, or the or operations of the, the, the restaurant and cafe and also the rights and licensing function. And so they operate as mini businesses, which um, severs from the museum the, oh, we're getting involved with grubby commercialism, so that's helpful in some respects, but also means these things have to operate in their own profit-making environment, which means it's then no longer a benefit to those parts of the organization for them to actually appreciate any of the input that comes from the central part of the organization. So you get uh, a cost model which has got nothing to do with the actual total cost to the museum. It's only got, well, you know, we put some tables down, people came and sat at them and, and ate, that's, that's, the, that's, that's us making money for you, isn't it? Without actually looking at, well, how much is that space costing the museum to exist in the first place? Or how much is it costing the museum to provide those images to the image rights people in the first place and satisfy those services, etc.? So you have this very, very complex relationship between who, who provides the money and how that money then filters down as an influence on museum behaviours. You also have, um, uh, and it's why I point so strongly to the data, data spaces development at uh, European level, because that is going to be an incredible driver for, uh, for national policy, and because um, it links together things that haven't been linked together before in European, in European digital world. So it's linking together health, with commerce and with science and tech and with culture and with all the other bits. And in doing so, by creating that continuous concept of data talking to each other and having uh, a, a relationship to each other, um, it makes it more likely that either museums will get left behind because they can't engage in the way that all the others can, or there's an opportunity. And I think that we might find that you get a widening gaps between the haves and haves nots in, the, in, in this environment until someone says, actually, no, we, re we can see that gap. And we need to do something about it. And I don't want to underestimate the, 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 the cultural aspect of this as well. So when I talk about institutional management, when I'm talking about my own institution, how do we get things done? We talk about research culture, we talk about teaching culture, we talk about um, the culture in which we're trying to get things done. Because we can strategize as much as we like, but culture eats, eats strategy for breakfast. Whatever your culture is, that's the thing that will define what you can do, not what strategy you try and impose from above. And one of the ways that I've seen that most recently is one of my PhD students has been doing research in, in China about the impact of Chinese museums and trying to use the model, my balance value impact model. And one of the things in the balance impact model is it says these are the value lenses, and one of those is um, community um, as a value lens. Community does not have a word equivalent in Chinese. It doesn't have, it's an umbrella word. We know community to mean, it can mean a group of people who are interested in the same thing, a group of people who live in the same area, you know, various different umbrella fr fr uh, areas in the Chinese language and therefore in the government policy and in every 
government uh, strategy from there. There isn't a single word that covers that. So, it, so all of their policies are very specific. This is about your local community. This is about people who are interested in the same things. And it's very, very specific, which means that quite a lot of their top, top end strategizing when it comes down to the museums actually um, ha says, we don't care what your local community want from you because we, that's not who we think you're there for. We think you're there for X, Y, and Z. And so again, language, culture, um, both social and political in which, we're, in which we're trying to make decisions will very much drive what we can and can't do um, in those spaces. Part of the reason we can see why America has been able to make the steps it, it's made, made is because of the way its constitution works. Um, and uh, and how that is embedded in, in in their in their culture, it's in no it's in no by no means perfect um, at all, um, and also to do with the way that the drivers for money have changed. Um, I know that uh, in the UK, the British Museum and the British Library, and in the US, the National Gallery of Art, have had to change over the last eight to ten years to prove that they are genuinely national organisations. Not the London British Library, not the Washington National Gallery of Art, but the American National Gallery of Art, the British Library. And that's also become uh, a, a real motivator for digital, is to demonstrate we can actually be in every public library in the UK, we can actually be in every home in America, and how you get there, actually one of the things that Wikimedia has done is given a real economy of scale for achieving those sorts of uh, nationally based um, uh, uh, approaches in that sense. So I hope that answers, I'm not necessarily thinking I'm being very structured in that. Yes, I think, uh, thank you. And uh, if uh, there are no more questions, I think we have also reached the time to end this uh, session. I would uh, like to thank again uh, Trice Navarrete, Matthias Sali, and uh, Simon Tanner for this uh, very wonderful conversation and presentations. And uh, I do hope that this will uh, inform and uh, trigger some debate for uh, this very important uh, uh, resource that all we have and the institution, cultural institutions have, and uh, well, the way they manage it uh, is very important for everybody. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for uh, to all the audience.